Thank you, Senator, for joining us today. I, I know you have said in a previous interview today that the firing of Comey could not have come soon enough, but do you question at all the timing? It didn't come in January when we knew pretty much all we were going to know about the Hillary Clinton emails. It came now when an investigation into Russian ties in the election are full blown and people have questioned the timing. Do you question that timing? You know, I think there's been pretty much bipartisan sort of uh, consensus that Tomy, Comey should go. Uh, Harry Reid asked for him to resign several months ago. Chuck Schumer said that uh, he had lost confidence in him back in November. Hillary Clinton blames him for the election. So on the Democrat side, they feel like he was too verbal and insinuating that she was guilty. And on the Republican side, they say, well, gosh, if all that's true, why didn't you indict her? So really, I think both sides of the aisle have felt for some time that he's lost the confidence of both Republicans and Democrats. And really that the investigation of the email turned out to be so much more politicized than uh, I think either side would have liked to see it. The attorney general indirectly weighed in on the firing of Comey, even though he recused himself from the investigation into Russian possible ties to the election. Do you think that's appropriate that he now indirectly weighs well, you in know, on the, this? The, the, the FBI is part of the Department of Justice. So normally, if you're going to let somebody go, what would happen is there'd be a review process. And I think one of the reasons this took a little while to come around is, you know, Democrats blocked both the attorney general and then they also attempted to block the assistant attorney general. But those are the superiors to the FBI director. So they had to do a job performance and look forward to look through the evidence to see if they thought he could still continue to lead the FBI. So, no, I think it happened exactly as it should happened, should have happened. But there is a lot of talk and people are skeptical. Do you think it is time for a special prosecutor? Well, you know, I think I haven't seen any evidence of a crime being committed. If someone has committed a crime, let's put forward evidence of it or at least an accusation. I haven't even seen an accusation of a crime, so it seems a little premature to be talking about uh, setting up another investigation since we have about, uh, I don't know, five, six investigations going on already. So, uh, no, I think it uh, wouldn't make any sense unless you have uh, some sort of crime that you want to accuse someone of. In the president's letter to James Comey, he says, I appreciate the fact that you've told me on three occasions that I am not under investigation. So then from your previous comment, are you satisfied that the president is not the subject of an investigation? You know, I would, I would have no idea, but the president's saying the FBI told him three times that, they, that he was not the target of an investigation. And I think the reason he put that out is he knew that the uh, liberal media would come forward and have a field day and accuse him of somehow trying to stop an investigation. But uh, changing the director of the FBI really has nothing to do with what the FBI does in investigation. I mean, how many thousand people work at the FBI and the people immediately involved in any kind of investigation, I'm sure, showed up for work today just the, as much as they showed up for work yesterday. And finally, on the Comey issue, the president met with Russia's foreign minister today. He sent out tweets on the James Comey issue. He did not address the American people from a podium. Again, he spent the morning with Russia's foreign minister. Do you think that was the appropriate action? Well, you know, the president's job is to try to live in the world we have, try to avoid war, try to talk to both our adversaries and our friends. And so I think an important part of uh, the job is diplomacy. All right. Last night, the uh, city leaders in Covington reaffirmed the stance that they do not think tolls are appropriate for the Brent Spence Bridge. In the past, you have said you're going to let the people who use the bridge weigh in on the toll issue because it's so emotional. But do you still think, I you think you've said this in previous comments, that maybe there could be some kind of compromise? I'm open to being part of the discussion, but ultimately I think the decision ought to be made, you know, by those who live in the area on both sides of the river. Um, but I've always said that I'd be willing to try to bring people together to discuss it. There also might be some sort of intermediate stage such that maybe local people wouldn't be charged the toll and only those that are traveling through would be or that it would be greatly reduced. But ultimately there is this, um, this discussion. Without tolls, it's been taking a long time. I've been looking for other sources of revenue. In fact, one of the things I've proposed is that we allow capital to come home. Like, you know, America, um, Apple is said to have a couple hundred billion dollars overseas. 
let it come home at a reduced rate, but then put it into a road fund. I've been proposing that for several years. So I think that's one possibility. But I think the one thing we know is that the current gas tax does not bring in enough to really repair and replace the bridges that we need to in our country. It's the Senate's turn to now look at health care. And I know you had some objections to the House version. Will you go into that briefly and how you think the Senate version might differ? Well, you know what I've always been for is uh, repealing Obamacare because it's a disaster and hasn't worked. But I'd like to replace it with market reforms. I'd like to replace it with competition, uh, legalizing the sale of insurance, expanding people's ability to save. And one of the things I've become very excited about is letting people join a group. The real problem in healthcare is not if you work for Toyota or General Motors. If you're in a large group insurance plan, you're pretty well protected. It's the individuals that have a problem. Plumbers, carpenters, welders, pest control, farmers. Because if someone in your family gets sick, you're treated as a very small pool and your rates get jacked up. Or the insurance company says they won't insure you at all. If we could get those people that are in small businesses or self-employed, let them join a group. Let them join a big, large, nationwide group. We'd drive prices down, but we'd also fix most of this worry about people getting sick and not being allowed, not being able to get insurance or afford insurance. So in a way, making it like your auto insurance, that I'm part of a great big group. I live in Ohio, and I can go where I want to get auto insurance? Exactly. Life insurance is sold that way, too. It's not really, regar it's not really with regard to where you live. It's with regard to your age. The other thing life insurance does is that if I bought a one-year life insurance policy and then I had a heart attack, they'd jack my rates up because I would have a pre-existing addition. The way life insurance fixes this is you have a 20-year policy. So if I get sick in my 20-year policy, they can't jack up my rates. The only way to protect yourself against the insurance company swooping in and charging you a fortune is really to have multi-year insurance policies. So I've been promoting for quite some time now that if we had the leverage of a large buying pool, you could tell the insurance company, I want a multi-year policy. If it's one person, they'll tell you to take a flying leap and they'll gouge you for more money and then treat you like refuse. But if you actually have the leverage of a group, you can negotiate for a much better product. And the best product would be one that goes on year after year and, di and does protect you uh, from pre-existing conditions. So that's what I was going to ask you about. In terms of the pre-existing conditions, so many people objected to the House version and the pre-existing conditions, so how those people would be treated. You see this then as freeing up those people to be part of a big group where you're not just doing a risk pool with those who are very sick. You are spreading out that risk. And then with that... Right bring their premiums down or would it actually mandate that you can't charge more for people with pre-existing conditions? The largeness of your group, you get a bulk discount anytime you buy in bulk. So if Walmart buys widgets and mom and pop's hardware store buys widgets, Walmart gets a cheaper price. Same way for insurance, same way for dealing with MasterCard or Visa or anything like that. The bigger you are, the cheaper price you get. So a big group would be a cheaper price. But realize that's not in the House bill currently. So the House bill as it stands tries to insure against sick people by the taxpayers subsidizing the insurance companies. I think that's a foolish notion. Insurance companies already make $15 billion a year. They don't really listen to their consumer. And so, no, we need to empower the consumer to have more uh, of a more leverage against the insurance companies. All right, I'm sure everyone's very anxious to see what the Senate hammers out. And well, one quick question, do you have a town hall meeting planned anytime soon? I don't have my schedule in front of me, but we did, I think, over 150 town halls in the last year, and we'll continue to do them. All right, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.